Good morning and welcome to Wednesdays in the Word. My name is Rick Rains. I'm the senior minister here at Fairmount Christian Church, and it's a delight to have you join us for our Wednesday morning Bible study today. Today is uh, May 13th, and uh, I don't know how many weeks we've been doing this. I think about two years now, it feels like. Uh, but uh, we're, I hope you're enjoying this. I hope you are enjoying their time online. It's not the same as, as meeting together. Uh, but it is a, it is certainly a good substitute, and I hope that uh, you're enjoying uh, plugging into the Bible with me on Wednesday mornings. You know, I, none of us know, of course, when the church is going to reopen for worship. I do suspect that even after it opens for worship, we may not be meeting for special classroom uh, meetings, classroom studies, and so forth. I'm not really sure how all that's going to pan out. Uh, so I, I'm basically planning to just stay uh, here online through the month of June. Uh, that's usually our, our break time for the summer anyway. So uh, just I'm planning to do these every week until uh, the end of June and look hope that you'll join me. And uh, you're certainly welcome to invite your friends to join us uh, for Wednesdays in the Word as well. Uh, grab a snack, grab your coffee, you got mine, and uh, let's pray together and we'll dig in. All right, let's pray. God, thanks for uh, today. Thanks for another day of life. You place opportunities before us every day and, and we want to make the most of every opportunity regardless of whether we're out in the world or whether we're isolated at home. We want to make the every make the most of every opportunity you give us in life. Today, Father, you've given us an opportunity to study the word together and as we open up the word of your apostle Peter, um, may we be blessed not only to learn, but may we be blessed to know how better to live. Lord, we want to live close to you, walk with you, have nothing standing in the way between uh, us and a full relationship with you. So guide us in those ways today as we open your word in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, we're in First Peter. Chapter 1, we're studying this uh, letter that Peter writes, uh, his friends that he refers to, his friends in exile there in Asia Minor. We believe he, he writes this uh, at some point around the uh, mid-60s, and so uh, in just a few short years, uh, Peter will be martyred for his faith. Most scholars believe that there is persecution going on there in Asia Minor of the, of the Christian community, probably has not reached the levels that it will reach under Emperor Nero, and that's quickly approaching. Um, but for now, their persecution is in more probably socioeconomic, familial persecution, but certainly there's active persecution, and Christians are uh, being called to be um, um, perseverant in the midst of that crisis, and that's why uh, we chose First Peter as why uh, as to look through that during this time, but also while we're looking at it on Sunday mornings, uh, how to thrive in the midst of crisis. And so uh, last week uh, we uh, got through uh, verse twelve, and I want to pick up today in uh, verse thirteen. If you want to follow along with me, chapter one, First Peter. Verse 13, therefore, prepare your minds for action, be self-controlled, set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. All right. So now, if you remember correctly, yeah, we're working through First uh, Peter on Sunday mornings, basically going to be taking a chapter a week. And uh, so we started that this past Sunday, and this was the passage that we focused on this past Sunday. So I don't want to reiterate a lot of that. If you weren't with us Sunday, um, I certainly encourage you to go on the our YouTube channel there and then look up last Sunday's uh, message. You're certainly welcome to do that, not because the message is any good, but because we did focus on what it means to be holy. One way to thrive in this time of, of isolation, one way to thrive in, this, in any crisis is to follow the tenets of Scripture. And Peter says, number one, he says, be holy. And so can you be holy? Of course you can, because the Bible says you can. The Bible tells us that we are holy. Having God's Holy Spirit in us, we are set apart from the rest of the world. We are different from the rest of the world. Can we be different? Of course we can. And the Bible, uh, Peter's letter, for instance, goes into details on how exactly we are to be different. And so he, he, sets, he sets up for us in this passage what a different life looks like. 
And uh, I'm, I'm reading on Wednesday mornings, I'm reading from uh, the 1984 version of the NIV. This past Sunday, I used a more current version. So some of the words, although same meaning, some of the words were a little bit different. And I think that makes for just an even more rich study. Uh, last on Sunday, we said that one of his tenets for holy living is alertness. In the current version that we're using today, it was it is minds that are prepared. And that is so important for us to think about in terms of holiness. We need a, a different kind of mindset to face the, the troubles of this world. It is alertness, alertness to Satan's attempts to pull us down. It is preparation, constantly staying prepared by being in his word, being in, in prayer, being in worship, which even though we're apart, we can still do together. And of course, we can worship on our own. He talks about self-control as a, as a tenet of holiness. Uh, we also use the word soberness. He says here, discipline yourselves, practice self-control, soberness. So many worldly uh, passions that have to be tempered, whether we are out in public or whether, they're, whether we are all alone. Be, fr be free from the mental and spiritual distractions that are so rampant in our world. Part of holiness is, is saying no to the distractions, saying no to the temptations of the evil one, who I guarantee you is not self-isolating during this time. He is still out roaming around looking for ways to pull you down and pull you into sin or pull you into despair or pull, just pull you into distraction from, the, um, from uh, what you need to be doing as a follower of Christ. Uh, my favorite, he tells, if, if uh, a tenant of holiness is, is being full of hope. We are fully hopeful people. Um, we place our hope in a lot of things. Our number one place for hope, the most reliable place to put our hope is in Jesus. And that's, of course, an important uh, concept, important, an important part of holiness. We're told to be obedient uh, in all that we do. And this, this might be how we most distinguish ourselves as different from the rest of the world. We are told in Scripture how to behave. We are told what to do and what not to do. Uh, being a follower of Christ is not a bunch of rules and regulations, but being a follower of Christ, I want to do things that please him, and I don't want to do things that displease him. And so those things are very clearly spelled out for us in Scripture. Peter uses the term here, be obedient, be obedient children. Um, and so uh, uh, I want to be an obedient child of God. I always wanted to be an obedient ch a child of my parents, and I always was, always. Um, I certainly want to be an obedient child of God. And then uh, he says also not to conform to evil, not, conf not, not pattern your life after the patterns of the people around us. Our world always is trying to get us to be like them, to act like them, to buy what they buy, to spend our time like they spend their time, to worry like they worry, to live in fear like they live in fear. We don't want to do that. We want to be different. We want to pattern our lives differently. We don't want to conform to the evil things of this world. We also don't want to conform to the, uh, to the, to the world's way of approaching life. We want, to, we want to be different. We want to be holy. And so the, this passage reminds us of the importance of that. Leviticus tells us in um, a, a, at least three places to be holy. It is not something that we typically think we are capable of. We think of holiness as something that is for special people, um, the, you know, the most knowledgeable Christians, the people who, you know, pray for hours a day. I mean, all of these things that we attribute to holiness. No, scripture says that each of us are holy in God's eyes, and we need to act accordingly. We follow the, the holy example that God is for us. We'll never be divine, we'll never be God, but we can follow his holiness and, uh, and act in life like he acts. He came to this earth as, as a man. He came to this earth as Jesus Christ, and we can follow his example on what it means to live holy lives. All right, so we are, uh, you know, separated from the world right now in many, many different ways, and yet we're still called to be holy. People see how you act. They see how you worry. They see how you react, whether it's on social media, whether it is in uh, the comments you put on social media, whether it's the way you talk with the neighbors or the folks that you run into at the store when you're running in and running out. Uh, the world is watching how we how we react in this time of crisis, and so uh, let them see a holy life inside of you, inside of me. All right, let's uh, move on to the next uh, uh, 
set of scriptures here. Verse 17 says, since you call on a father who, judge, who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. That's another one of those common themes, stranger, exile, alien. Those words you'll see popping up throughout uh, Peter's writings. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. All right, so here uh, we, we are going to be evaluated by God. It's not, I don't think that's just a once, a one-time thing at Judgment Day. I think constantly God is evaluating us and keeping his eye on us and being watchful over us. Um, and so since he is watching what we do, he says that we need to live as strangers. Now, again, that's, that's that, what does he mean by that? Again, we live as um, exiles. We live as people who this is not our world. When he looks down, he sees a difference in our ways of acting, talking, thinking, spending, um, using our time. He sees that we are different from the rest of the world. He looks down and sees those things. He also sees whether we're living life in reverent, in reverent fear. Um, in our culture today, we don't like to think of fearing God. We we tend to, um, you know, uh, default to a loving God. We we don't like to think of Jesus angry, throwing people out of the temple. We like to think of Jesus as loving and having children sit on his lap. We we kind of choose the pictures. Well, all of the pictures are appropriate, and all of the pictures give us a full picture of who God is. And and there is an aspect of God that we need to fear reverently. It doesn't mean that we cower in fear and are afraid to move or afraid to lift our eyes up. It, it is simply that that reverent fear that means that we love him, we respect him, but we also know that he holds our lives in the palms of his hand, the palm of his hand. You know, because I'm a follower of Christ, I have nothing to worry about. But I also know that I serve a great almighty God. And I, I, there, there needs to be an aspect of that relationship that has, has fear in it, not, not to vote, motivate me to do what is right, but to remind me of what a great God he is. I don't want to be afraid of God, but I am told in Scripture to be to have reverent fear of God. And that's what I aspire to, and, and, and certainly what, what Peter reminds us to aspire to as well. All right. So he goes on and he says, uh, he talks about this redemption. He, he says, um, you know, we live our lives uh, in, in, in God's presence in this reverent fear, uh, knowing that we have been redeemed, knowing that our worthless lives have been exchanged for something of value. You know, that's what you do. You redeem a coupon. You take a worthless piece of paper and you get, you know, 50 cents off a pack of Fig Newtons, you know, whatever it is. Um, our redemption is the same. Our worthless lives were exchanged for a valuable life in Jesus Christ. He exchanged his incredibly valuable life for our worthless lives. And he talks about that here in this passage. Um, uh, it's not redemption that could be bought. It's not redemption that one could buy with silver or gold. It's redemption that was purchased through the most precious commodity uh, on the face of the earth, and that was the blood of Jesus Christ, the most pr precious commodity in world history, Jesus' own blood, Jesus' own life. I think it's, uh, it's I, one of the things I like to do when I do a Bible study, one of the things I like to do sometimes with the, the Wednesday group, sometimes I, I do it probably more often with the Thursday men's group that I lead, um, is I, as I often pose the question, if this was all we had, if, if first Peter was the only book of the Bible that we had, you know, what would we learn about faith? What would we learn about Jesus? What would we learn about God? And I think every book of the Bible, that's a healthy exercise to participate in because it, it kind of narrows our focus into that one particular passage. And it also reminds us of the richness, not only of the entire Bible, when you put all of it together, how much we can learn about Jesus, how much we can learn about God. But it also reminds us of the richness of every single book of the Bible. 
Now, there are things that we don't learn in every single book of the Bible. That's why we have all of them put together uh, for our practice, for the practice of our faith. But I think it's a fun exercise sometimes to just say, if I only had this passage, if I only had this book, what would I learn about Jesus? Just think about that here with the passage I just read for you. What would we learn about Jesus if this was all we had about him? I'm going to read part of that over again for you. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. You know, when I look at this passage, uh, just those few verses right there, there's so much we can learn about Jesus. Now, if this is all we had, it would certainly raise up some more questions. We'd be like, what does that mean? But just think about just from those verses I read, what did I read there? I read there, what, 18 through 21. I read four verses. What would we learn there about Jesus? We would learn that his blood is a precious thing. Now, the Bible, well, let's go without the Bible. What would we, well, we know when one bleeds, one can bleed to death. The blood that is within us is what keeps our bodies alive. That Our blood is a precious commodity. You take blood out of you, you will not be alive. You take the blood out of, a, out of any animal, it will not be alive. And so Jesus's blood is referred to here as precious. His blood is a precious commodity that we have. Um, it is something that is more precious than silver or gold, which of course our world puts in, you know, incalculable value, value on. Um, the price of an ounce of gold is astronomical. Well, the price of an ounce of Jesus's blood is worth more than all of the gold and silver in the universe. And so this verse reminds, this verse teaches us that we knew nothing about Jesus, that there's something special about his blood. The passage refers to Jesus as a lamb. Now, you have to, if you, this is all you had, you'd have to make some leaps there. Is he, is he really talking about a sheep or is he talking, is this a metaphor? And I think through the whole context, I think you would see that it's a metaphor. And so you would learn a lamb. Well, a lamb, what, what's a lamb? Well, a lamb is a precious creature. A lamb is a special creature, an innocent creature. A lamb is a um, is a, a, a beautiful uh, uh, baby that you see out in the the world. Uh, maybe if you you know when you go by a farm or whatever and you see a lamb, you go to a petting zoo, you see a lamb. You go out to Maymont and go to their uh, nature area, you'll see baby lamb. You know you see lambs there. And so by that, I, even if you weren't familiar with sacrificial systems and what a lamb meant, I think you would learn from that that Jesus is 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 precious. And that um, the blood of that precious lamb is something that is meaningful to me as as a as a human being reading this passage. Now, if you read that as well, you would know that, that it was a lamb without blemish or defe defect. It's a perfect lamb. It's a perfect. Uh, and so why does that matter? Well, a perfect lamb in our culture would be valued, uh, might uh, be the one that's uh, uh, chosen for the state fair to be uh, to be um, judged, you know, but you know that it's an incredibly special animal. Every, just about every animal that's born, just about every person that's born has some defect somewhere. Uh, we, you know, our bodies are not perfect, but this lamb's body is indeed perfect. And so we would learn that Jesus is this precious creature that is perfect, and there's something precious about its blood. We would learn as we read this passage that, that, that this Jesus had a, he was pre-existent before there was anything ever created. He was in existence. That means that he's not just this, a lamb. He's an amazing being of all history. We would know that he has a, a special pur purpose. He was chosen. And we know what his special, we know what his special purpose is. And we see that in the context here. He comes to earth. He lives like we do. He uh, teaches us. He teaches us great lessons. And then he dies on the cross for our sins and then rises from the dead for our, uh, to conquer death for us. And so we, we know all of that. But in just reading that context, we might not be fully aware of all that he, all that he did for us. But we know that he was chosen. He had a special purpose uh, before the world was uh, was even even created, this per this passage tells us that he raised from the dead. Wow, I don't know who this Jesus is, but he raised from the dead. This uh, precious 
um, lamb of God, this, uh, this perfect being, this one who's existed since before the world began, this one who had a special purpose and came to this earth and lived here amongst us. He rose from the dead. Wow. We'd learn something about resurrection here, wouldn't we? We would learn that after his resurrection, he was glorified. Again, if we only had this to go by, we may not know what that means, but we do know that after his resurrection, I would, I, anybody who raised from the dead, I would think is pretty awesome. And so we can, we can immediately place that someone who is raised from the dead certainly is worthy of glorification, worthy of worship, worthy of, uh, of, um, of adoration. And that's certainly what happens. Now we know when you put the rest of scripture in context that his glorification is in his, is in his uh, resurrection and his ascension. Uh, he is now back on the throne in heaven and uh, God glorified him and, and gave him a, a name above all names, a seat above all seats, a place above all places. But just reading this passage right here, you would know that after he died and rose from the dead, he became a glorified being. And then, um, this passage would say, if we if we were all, if this is all we had about Jesus, um, through him you believe in God, and so your faith and hope are in God. It's through Jesus who leads me to uh, to God, to the Father. This passage would remind of this. John fourteen six says, "I am the way." Jesus says, "I am the way, the truth, and the life." If I didn't have John fourteen six, I would read this passage right here, and I would know that that Jesus, the special precious lamb, this one whose blood is more valuable than anything else, this one who existed before time began, who came to this earth with a special mission, who died and is now glorified, is the one who can lead me to God. We all know that there's, there's a, a, a taste, a, a desire for eternity that's placed in our hearts. I don't need scripture to tell me that. We all have this desire for a spiritual connection with God. And this passage here tells me that spiritual connection is created by Jesus. Now, that's just a that's just a simple exercise that any of us can do. Anytime you pick up scripture, uh, one of the ways, if you're looking for a fresh way to study the Bible or, or something like that, just read any passage, whether it's one verse, a whole chapter, or a whole book, and just simply ask yourself those questions. If I had nothing else, what would I know about God? What would I know about Jesus? What would I know about faith? What would I know about uh, about the, the the nature of um, of man? What you know? What what would I learn if I only had that passage? It's just a, I think a simple way and a um, uh, a different kind of way to consider scripture. And uh, and we just did that there with that passage. All right, let's move on. Uh, verse twenty two says, "Now you now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart." For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and, and enduring word of God. So last week, um, you know, we saw uh, the, what the, the, um, uh, the churches there were doing that were so that, that so pleased Peter. He then directs their teaching into a time on what holiness is. We talked about that earlier in our study today. And now he's going to apply that holiness to three areas of our lives. He's going to apply it to, Three different ways to that. If you're holy, if you're holy people, our, 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 our being a new creation in Christ, our holiness is going to um, um, impact different areas of our lives. In this passage, he identifies three of those different areas. The first is it's going to impact our love for others. Um, that you, Now that you purified yourselves by obeying the truth, uh, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deep, what love one another deeply from the heart. Our new relationship with Christ, the fact that we are in Christ, leads to sincere love for others. And I always find when when um, the New Testament writers, uh, whoever they may be, talk about loving the brothers, you know, loving the the, the, the church family. I always have to ask myself: is he is he singling out the church? Or is he referring to all, you know, my brother man, you know, mankind? Is he referring to all humanity? Uh, and I think it's a fair question to ask. I think in the context here, Peter is talking about the church. Okay. But I also know that any application of, uh, of the church, uh, any way that I'm supposed to love people in the church is also the way I'm supposed to love people outside the church. Jesus said, when, I, you know, when, uh, when asked, well, who's my neighbor? When Jesus said, love your neighbor like yourself, well, who's my neighbor? Well, he picked uh, the, the Jews' greatest enemy, 
as their neighbor. And so um, we know when he says, love your neighbor, when the scriptures say, love your brother, love your sister, uh, that it's uh, referring to, to more than just simply uh, the person who lives next door to you, neighbor, or the person in your in your church. He's talking about everybody. Um, I think in this passage right here, it's such a powerful reminder that our love is meant um, is is meant to be sincere uh, for each other. Um, it's not supposed to be it's not supposed to be fake. It's not supposed to be a uh, put on. It's not supposed to be hypocritical. Hypocritical. It's love that is true and sincere from the heart. And that doesn't always come naturally. It's something that sometimes has to be developed. You have to pray about it. You have to love some unlovable people. You have to love some people that are very difficult to love. But the agape love that, that Peter talks about here is so critical for our faith, and it sh truly shows whether we are new creations in Christ and whether we are acting in a, with a holy lifestyle. And so we need to um, love others sincerely. Uh, he does add here uh, in that passage that that our um, that our new birth, our new faith, comes through um, uh, the living and enduring Word of God. I love that. Uh, I love that phrase there. The living and enduring Word of God. That, of course, is the Bible for us today. Um, the Word of God is is uh, is written down for us, but it's also revealed to us through the Holy Spirit. Um, but we always know that anything that that the Holy Spirit whispers in our ears that when we're led to do something, if it is not consistent with scripture, then it's not coming from the Holy Spirit. It's not coming from the living and enduring word of God. And so uh, we need to always compare the, our, our, our um, leadings uh, uh, to what the living, enduring word of God tells us. And so that's why it's so precious that we can own our own copies of it. We can read it ourselves. We can memorize it ourselves. And so my prayer is always that this preacher and every preacher that um, that ever preaches at Fairmount, and, um, maybe your church, if you're not a Fairmounter, that they're always preaching uh, from the word and that they're always preaching from that word as if it was a living and enduring document, not one that changes over time, not one that was applicable at one time, but not applicable anymore, one that's applicable for all time. And it's certainly applicable for our times right now, the living and enduring word of God. All right, uh, let's see, let's go to chapter two. Um, oh, all right, I didn't finish. I apologize for that. I should have kept on reading there. He says there in verse 24, for all men are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Uh, I love it there that he uh, quotes from Isaiah 40, again, connecting the Old Testament. Peter didn't know that his letter was going to become scripture. We know, uh, the Holy Spirit knew it. And so connecting the, the word of God, Isaiah 40, all men are like grass. He talks about uh, connecting that with, the, uh, with the, the word of the New Testament, Peter's letter here. Um, men, women, we all do die. We fade away. We, we pass away. There's no, there's no question about that. God's word will never die, will never pass away. No matter what uh, humanity may do to it, no matter what scholars may say of it, it will never pass away. This is the word that, that uh, we preach at Fairmount. It's the word that uh, Peter was preaching to them. And the preachers, true preachers of the gospel will always preach uh, the uh, enduring, living, never dying word of God. All right. Sorry about that. Skipped over that passage for a second. Uh, all right. Verse one says of chapter two, therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy and slander of every kind. Now, that brings us to our um, our um, um, our uh, second um application of holiness. Holiness is applicable to different areas of our lives. It's applicable to the way we love the world around us, how we love the church. And then second of all, it, it is how we treat sin. And just in that one verse, he tells us to rid ourselves of it. In holiness, we can, there is no room for sin. And so we have to not only repent of our sin and say, I'm, I don't want to sin anymore, but we have to do our very best to eliminate sin, to avoid sin in our lives. Um, so when he says to get rid of it, we need to, I think we talked about this in our last study, we need to take it off like old dirty clothes and throw them out, get rid of them. I mean, you know, sometimes you just, you just get some piece of clothing so messed up, the only thing left to do with it is just toss it in the trash. So those are usually the clothes I like to keep, but that's another story for another day. Um, 
uh, we need to get rid of those sins in our lives. Not just not just say, oh, I'm not going to do it anymore. We need to rid ourselves of those things. He mentions here malice, uh, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. I, I think you probably know what those things are. Um, uh, I, I did ask myself, what's common amongst those those five things? Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. How about that those are the things that are the very first thing to undermine a church family? Those are the first things that undermine the unity of the body of Christ. Those are the first things to undermine a community of faith, malice, want, you know, wishing harm on others, deceit, being dishonest with others, hypocrisy, envy of other, you know, all of those things that he mentions there. Are those not the very first things that, uh, that are the, uh, the, the characteristics that undermine the, the Christian church? And so therefore we need to avoid those things. That's one of the ways we apply the ho that holiness to our lives. Then he comes to the other, uh, the other application of holiness to our lives. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Oh, I love that phrase right there. All right, that third application, we want to, uh, we want to love others sincerely. We want to rid ourselves of sin. And then in an application of our holiness, we want to, we want to uh, grow spiritually. We want to desire uh, spiritual growth. Um, I think that's um, um, something that I, you probably wouldn't be on here today if you were not somebody who was craving spiritual milk. Um, we don't want uh, defiled nourishment. We don't want um, nourishment that is, um, you know, uh, halfway. We want true, nutritious, spiritual teaching. And so, um, um, we, we want to be growing in our faith, not just simply, hey, I'm a Christian now, I don't need to do anything else. I'm good. I'm good to go. No, we need to be on a daily basis craving the nourishment that helps us to grow as Christians. Um, this word here that he uses for spiritual uh, milk, he goes crave pure spiritual milk, pure that's undefiled, no falseness, no false teaching, um, but spiritual milk. The word that he uses there for spiritual is the word logikos. Greek word logikos, and that that all has within there uh, the the root of 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 logic, uh, the root the root word of the word logos, and so that spiritual milk is war is um, spiritual nourishment that comes from the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Of course, that's Jesus, um, the word. Um, is, is in this case here, the, the spiritual nourishment that we so very much need. It is Jesus. It is revealed, revealed to us in the Bible. It comes from God. It is, it is written and it is living. And unless we are in relationship with Jesus, unless we are in uh, the word itself, uh, we will struggle uh, to grow spiritually. In fact, I don't think we can. So, um, you know, we, we look at our spiritual lives today and ask, are we, are we feeding it? Now, uh, you know, Paul will talk about, you know, you started with milk, now you need to move on to meat, and that's all good. Um, but, but Peter here just simply refers to our spiritual nourishment as a, a diet of, of pure uh, spiritual milk. Um, I love uh, the life application study notes say that the more we taste God's goodness, the more tasteless other worldly options will become. That's one of my favorite uh, phrases in scripture. Um, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. What a beautiful phrase there for us to remember each and every day that the Lord is good. And I hope you're tasting of his goodness daily. If you're not in the word, you can't taste of his goodness. If you're not in prayer, you can't taste of his goodness. If you're not worshiping, you can't taste of his goodness. If you're not listening to his voice, you can't taste of his goodness. And so we want to taste of his goodness on a daily basis. And that's my prayer and encouragement for you today, that you will be tasting of his goodness as often as you can. Now I'm, I'm you know, um, whatever years old, okay? And yet I, I still drink milk every day. I'm probably not supposed to. It's full of probably bad things for me and all that kind of stuff. But there's just nothing that I like more than, you know, Fig Newtons and a glass of milk or um, I, I eat milk with I drink milk with pizza. And, you know, people look at me like, 
you need to go in another room. I get all that. I love, I love milk. It's just something about it. I just have always loved it. Um, I want my life to be characterized by a love of the spiritual milk that is the word, that is Jesus, that is the Bible. And that's my prayer for you today as well. As we are separated from each other, make sure that you're taking a daily diet of the, of the pure spiritual milk of uh, spiritual growth. Uh, you know, he says there, this is how we grow up in salvation. You're saved, you have eternal life, but each and every day we grow in our uh, relationship that is salvation with Jesus Christ. And that's my prayer for you today. Let's pray together. God, thanks for the special time that we have together today. Thank you for the milk that you give us. You do not leave us nourish, nourishmentless. Um, you give us great nourishment. It is available to us at all times. Lord, even if, the, even if the world took away our Bibles, we have your spirit within us. We have our relationship with Jesus. We have the scriptures we have memorized. We have all of those things to continue to feed us. May we um, continue to feed on all of the great nourishment that you provide for us each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for uh, tuning in today as I try to encourage every time I have an opportunity to talk to people in our church. If you have any needs whatsoever, please reach out to me. Uh, my uh, email address is rrains at fairmountcc.org. Uh, you can also find that on our um, uh, website, fairmountcc.org. And anything you need to just, just reach out to me. If you just want me to pray with you, I would be, I would be so honored. Uh, but if you have some needs, some physical needs, maybe something you're going through, you and your family, uh, reach out to us and we will do our very best to help you however we can. Uh, until we are together next week, I want to encourage you to tune into our worship services on Sunday. We'll be worshiping online this Sunday at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. You can find those uh, worship services on YouTube. Go on YouTube, type in Fairmount Christian Church, and it will take you to all the wonderful content that we have there. God bless you today, and I look forward to being with you again next Wednesday.